I must say that this is not a political judgment. Apartheid has a specific definition in international law. This is a legal judgment that must be based upon legal principles and the facts, and the facts are undeniable. So last night was the Green Party of Canada debate, and I have a couple clips to show you. Now, before I get to uh, these clips, full disclosure, I back one of the candidates. I back Dimitri Lascaris. But it's going to become pretty obvious as to why. If you watch this entire debate, and uh, most of you did not, maybe none of you did, <laughs> um, it was largely embarrassing. And I, in a variety of ways. I don't want to get too deep into it. I don't want to you know, create enemies here. But some of the responses from some of the candidates just outrageous for a Green Party debate. Completely outrageous. And uh, a lot of technical issues with the debate. Anyways, let's not get too deep into that because let's keep this positive. <laughs> there were a couple of great moments. I want to show you why I support Dimitri Lascaris. So this is a guy I interviewed, I think, uh, two weeks ago now. Um, the, uh, the vote for the leader begins on the 26th of this month, September. So if you are a Green Party member, which you should be by now, you have to be by, uh, by now to be able to vote, um, make sure you vote for Dimitri. So let me show you the first clip here. Everyone participating in this discussion, I have no doubt, doesn't like Donald Trump or agree with any of his policies. But Joe Biden is not really offering any significant change in policy in Latin America or the Middle East with regards or with regards to the 800 US military bases around the world. How would you as prime minister deal with Washington under Biden or Trump. Dimitri, so far we're, we're having a lot of agreement. I think that'll change as we get to other questions. Dimitri. It's about to change. Um, so I, uh, I'm surprised to hear that Christia Freeland is an example that we should all follow. Shortly <laughs> after she was appointed foreign minister, the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa sent a cable to Washington saying that Canada had adopted an America first foreign policy. And that's precisely what we did under Christia Freeland. There's no better example of this than the Canadian government's slavish approach to the situation in, uh, in Venezuela. With respect to Joe Biden, Joe Biden was the vice president when the United States participated in the destruction of Libya. Joe Biden was the vice president when the Obama administration immunized CIA torturers for culpability for uh, what they did with waterboarding under the Bush and Cheney administration. And he was also the vice president when the United States pursued a drone program in the Middle East principally, which constituted a series of heinous war crimes. In the foreign policy domain, there really isn't much difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. I'm very concerned about the fact that the Trump administration just imposed sanctions on the prosecutors of the International Criminal Court. We need to take a strong stand in support of the International Criminal Court prosecutors, give them safe haven, provide financial support to the ICC to ensure that they fulfill their mission of holding American war criminals accountable. At the same time, we have to recognize that we have allies in the United States, people who want to see a humane foreign policy, people like Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilana Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Senator Merkley. And we have to reach out to them, build alliances, and make clear that the American people are not our enemies. The problem here is the U.S. government, which oppresses many Americans just as much as it is oppressing people in the developing world. So we need to build those alliances within the United States, an alliance of non-belligerent countries internationally, and we need to plot a truly independent foreign policy in which no country, including the U.S., is exempt from international law. So as you see there, Dimitri Lascaris is uh, well-versed in foreign policy, understands uh, the role that the U.S. has played and how Canada has just gone along with all of it. And I got a few examples here. A reminder, I do have one more clip coming up. But uh, he mentioned... This, during his uh, response, Canada adopts America first foreign policy, U.S. State Department boasted in 2017 with the appointment of, uh, of uh, Foreign Minister Christia Freeland. So this was, so th in case you're wondering why that was brought up, an another, <laughs> somebody else in the debate, and this goes to, to part of the embarrassment of this debate, um, brought up Christia Freeland as Someone to look to when it comes to foreign policy. 
a Green Party debate. They pointed to the liberal, Christia Freeland. When her approach, and and as I want to show some examples here, and, and not even just her approach, the recognition from Americans that she's just going right along with US, with U.S. foreign policy, for this to be mentioned in a Green Party debate as someone to look to is completely insane. So just to read this little piece here, the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa boasted in a March 2017 memo that, quote, Canada adopts America's first foreign policy just after PM uh, Trudeau appointed hardline hawk Christia Freeland as foreign minister. So, of course, uh, Ben Norton here goes into a deeper story on this, but, I mean, it, it just... It, <laughs> that was maybe one of the most shocking parts of this debate uh, when that came up. Um, but to give you other examples, this happened today. In fact, I could almost do just a story on this. UN experts report on Yemen war names Canada as one of arms suppliers fueling the conflict. So Canada is now being named by the UN as being a major part of the problem when it comes to the war in Yemen. Because Canada sold armored vehicles to the Saudis that they used in this war. Yet no. God looked at Christia Freeland and, the, and Trudeau. Great example of how to handle foreign policy. Also, Venezuela, as Dimitri brought up, Canada hosts Lima Group meeting to find solutions to Venezuela crisis. Canada has been a major player when it comes to Venezuela and propping up Guaido as uh, Venezuela's legitimate leader, even though he is not, not democratically elected, but trying to put him into that, into that position, again, going right along with, UN, uh, with U.S. foreign policy. And in many ways, when it comes to Venezuela, you could say leading on this issue. One more clip here. So uh, a lot of this debate was really focused on foreign policy, which I was surprised to see, <laughs> but it was nice to see. Um, so one more clip here from Dimitri. Desmond Tutu has compared Israel's position toward Palestine to the apartheid regime in South Africa. Canada currently has sanctions against 19 different countries. Should Canada consider sanctioning Israel? Well, when Elizabeth May came back from the West Bank in 2018, she stood in Ottawa at a press conference, and you can see this on YouTube, and standing beside two other MPs said that what Israel is doing to occupied Palestinians is much worse than apartheid in South Africa. This was a view that was echoed by Professor Noam Chomsky. It was a view that was echoed by John Dugard, a South African human rights lawyer, former UN Special Rapporteur for the human rights situation in occupied Palestine. This is also the view adopted by international jurist Richard Falk, who concluded recently in a meticulous report that the evidence Israel is committing the crime of apartheid is overwhelming. I must say that this is not a political judgment. Apartheid has a specific definition in international law. This is a legal judgment that must be based upon legal principles and the facts, and the facts are undeniable. If we supported BDS, sanctions in some form being applied to the apartheid regime in South Africa, there is absolutely no reason in good conscience that we would not equivocally and clearly say that we support the use of well-designed economic sanctions to bring to an end the apartheid racist regime to which Palestinians have been subjected for decades. I have been clear about this. I sponsored a resolution in the Green Party of Canada, which called for economic sanctions on Israel. It was ratified with over 90% support ultimately. And we are the only party today in parliament that officially calls for economic sanctions on Israel. I think that that's something that we should all be proud of because it is exactly what is required if you're dealing seriously with international law and want to act in accordance with conscience. So he absolutely killed it. If you saw some of the responses from some of the other candidates, and I'm not going to show them because a lot of them don't have a large audience. I don't need to uh, kickstart, you know, destroying any of their careers. But my God, <laughs> truly embarrassing, some of the other responses. Um, but apart from that, Dimitri here completely nailed it and has been involved in trying to push the Green Party into the correct position. And by the way, I, I love that he brought up South Africa, because this is a way to help explain how twisted the narrative is right now with Israel-Palestine. Because sanctions were supported. BDS was a part of ensuring uh, 
true freedom in, in, in South Africa. Yet, when it comes to Israel-Palestine, no. It's too extreme. Yet, how is it so extreme if the exact same approach was applied before? Again, this is a non-violent approach. BDS is non-violent. Yet, too extreme. So, I want to show you um, this. South African MP Manla Mandela calls for civil society to support uh, BDS. So, this is... Nelson Mandela's grandson. And Mandela Mandela calls on international civil society to ask their governments to support the boycott of Israel in the same way they did with South Africa. The South African leader, grandson of Nelson Mandela, uh, analyzed on a video conference the similarities between Israeli and South African apartheid. So Nelson Mandela's grandson supports BDS. How can anybody possibly view this as extreme? Again, this goes to the issue with the media narrative, and unfortunately, even candidates for the Green Party leadership are propping up that bullshit, despite the fact that history is not on their side. I'm going to show you uh, Manla Mandela here discussing his support for BDS. BDS is playing a crucial role in bringing Palestinians together and in ensuring that they fight a common enemy, that being the brutal apartheid regime of Israel. BDS uh, upholds the simple principle that Palestinians are entitled to the same rights as the rest of humanity. We are making a global call in support of BDS because BDS is not a railing on partisan lines. It is calling on all Palestinians to unite against a common enemy, to boycott divestment, and ensure we are able to place sanctions against the apartheid Israeli regime. So this is a no-brainer. And... You know, it, it's it's unfortunate that it is so that it's that it's impressive when a political leader comes out in support of this. And I'm talking about Dimitri Lascaris. It like it, it it shouldn't be surprising. It shouldn't be impressive. It should be obvious because all the facts are on the side of supporting BDS. Yet even in a Green Party debate, it was uh heavily contested so anyways you got to support dimitri uh absolutely fantastic he's the only if you watch that debate and if you're a green party member go watch that debate you can find it online to search up green party debate over the past week in youtube search you'll see it <laughs> there there is no there is no comparison everybody else was way out of their element uh and it also appeared no, no one else really had a clear vision. I mean, look, there were a couple of the ca- uh, of other candidates who weren't bad. I will say that. Um, uh, I'm forgetting their names now, unfortunately. But there were a couple of uh, Maryam and uh, so Amita Kudner and Maryam Haddad. So they were largely solid, but they don't have the experience that Dimitri has, and they don't have the clarity in vision in being able to communicate their vision. Um, that Dimitri has. And also Dimitri is, is I believe, second place in fundraising and has the most uh, small dollar uh, support. So, And he's second only behind, uh, I believe, Glenn Murray, who is a former liberal. <laughs> there is a former liberal running for Green Party leadership. Man. Look, if you're if you're in the Green Party in Canada, I understand liking some of these other candidates, or at least two of these other candidates, but it's important to consolidate the vote because the way, the only way we're going to lose this leadership race is if our vote is split up among multiple candidates. If we all consolidate our vote around Dimitri, who has the best shot right now at leadership, then he can win. And imagine, imagine the change in discussion. Imagine the kind of debate we can have, 
especially when it comes to foreign policy, which right now we have a very, very narrow discussion with foreign policy in Canada. Imagine the kinds of discussions we can have as a country in the media if he becomes the leader of the Green Party. So make sure you pay attention to what's going on and uh, vote for Dimitri when voting starts later this month.